in Ideal Missionary Volunteer, a sketch of the life and character of William Whitney Bourdon. Footnote. The biography of William W. Bourdon is being prepared by Rev. Samuel M. Last name spelled Z W E M E R, comma D D, at the respect request of the family. Any friends who have letters or incidents that they could contribute are requested to send them immediately to the editor of this review. By Professor Charles E. Erdman, D.D., Princeton, New York. Since the death of Ian Keith Faulkner at Aden, Arabia, in 1887, the missionary world has suffered no more mysterious loss than in the death of William Whitney Bourdon, which occurred on April 9, 1913, at Cairo, Egypt. In each case, a chosen workman, particularly fitted for a difficult and important task, is called from the field when the service is but begun, and the Christian world wonders at the inscrutable providence of God. Many points of similarity have been noted in these two brief lives. One was of the flower of Britain nobility. The other represented the best product of American social and academic life. Both were men of physical and intellectual strength, of unusual wealth, of marked personal attractiveness, who were wholly devoted to the service of Christ. Both studied in Egypt in preparation for ministry, missionary work among Muslims. Both left behind them surprising wide circles of influence and lives they had affected in forms of service they had fostered. When the heroic death of Keith Faulkner was announced at New College, Edinburgh, and a volunteer was asked for his place, it is said that 13 of the graduating class at once responded. The example of Keith Faulkner's consecration was an important factor in establishing the student volunteer movement, which, in the next few years, led thousands of young men and women of England and America to take service on the foreign field. William Bourdon, in addition to other abiding influences of his life and service, has bequeathed for the evangelizing of the world a larger sum than any man of equal years in the entire history of the Christian Church. Boyhood and School Life In the very year Keith Faulkner died in Arabia, William Borden was born in the city of Chicago in, on November 1, 1887. He was a son of the late William Bourdon and of Mary de Gomor Whitney Bourdon. From his father he inherited business qualities of a high order, executive abilities, exactness, fairness of mind, faculty in reading character, promptness, decision, and a rare kindliness of judgment which made him absolutely silent as to the faults and failings of others. To his mother he was indebted for the influence which in early boyhood resulted in definite religious convictions in a public confession of faith in Christ, in habits of Bible study and in the daily prayer, that the will of God might be wrought out in his life. This is the real secret of his remarkable character and his unusual career. William Bourdon's school life was spent at the University School in the Manual Training School of Chicago and at Hill School, Pottstown, Pennsylvania, before entering Yale University in 1905. He spent a year in foreign travel, and it was an experience that turned the whole tenure of his life and thought. The Rev. Walter C. Ertman, who is now serving as a missionary in Korea, was chosen as a Christian companion to accompany him in a tour of the world. They visited Japan, China, India, Egypt, Syria, and Turkey, enjoying unusual opportunities to observe the problems, the methods, and the results of Christian work in many of the great mission fields. They saw the great and indescribable need of the world for the gospel. 
to one who was convinced of the unique power of Christ to meet that need. The call to serve was definite and clear. William Bourdon's decision were never hasty, but both he and his companion returned from that tour with a purpose. If God so willed it, to devote their lives to service on the foreign field. He had not been in mission lands eight weeks when he wrote home that he wished to become a foreign missionary. Later, when he was asked by a wandering friend why he planned to throw his life away among the heathen, he replied significantly, You have never seen heathenism. This year travel was marked by another important experience when in England, shortly before sailing for home, he attended a meeting conducted by the Rev. R. A. Torrey, D.D., where the truths emphasized were the tests of the new birth. These, given in the first epistle of John, are righteousness, avoidance of known sin, love of the brethren, belief in Christ as the Son of God, and overcoming the world. As was his added original comments, a new determination was born in him that day to bring all his life into conformity with the scripture standards in things both great and small that he might please his master, bringing every thought into captivity to the obediency of Christ. This became the vital and controlling purpose of his career. When Borden entered Yale University in the fall of 1905, he at once became a positive factor in the religious life of the institution. He was active in athletics, a good boxer, skillful at tennis, and a yachtsman, and became very fond of mountain climbing. At the same time, he maintained a high standard of scholarship, qualified twice over in two separate years for election to the Phi Beta Kappa, on of which the society he became the president. But it was not in the athletic nor in the academic activities of the university that his influence was most strongly felt. It was rather in the lines of definite Christian work. He was elected class deacon, served as leader of the student volunteer band for foreign missions, and for two years was president of the Connecticut Valley Student Volunteer Union. He also generously contributed to the Yale mission in central China and aided in the formation of bands for prayer and for Bible study, and in the organization of classes for mission study. Any college man will realize what it cost him to refuse to allow his name to be considered for election to any of the popular college secret societies. This decision he reached, not so much on the ground that it would separate him from some of his fellow students, as for fear lest it might bring in something between himself and the service of the Lord. Religious Life at Yale his activities and religious work were not by any means confined to the sphere of university life. In his sophomore year, Borden was asked to join a little group in one of the rooms of Dwight Hall, the University YMCA building, and there pray that the way might be open to start a gospel mission, to bring the gospel message every night to the helpless and homeless and, and hopeless men of New Haven. The result was the founding of the Yale Hope Mission at 55 to 59 Court Street in March 1907, a work largely financed by Borden's generous gifts. Great numbers of men have been reached by this rescue mission, and it has also had a marked influence upon the university men. Many have been enlisted as workers there and have learned the joy of Christian service, while others who came to the mission out of curiosity or friendly interest have there been convinced of the power of Christ to save unto the uttermost. Professor Henry B. Wright of Yale gives this testimony. It is my firm conviction that Yale Hope Missionary Missions has done more to convince all classes of men at Yale of the power and practicability of Christianity to regenerate individuals and communities than any other force in the university. Its influence for good among the students have been inestimable. The Rev. Henry W. Frost once asked a distinguished foreigner whom he had been showing some of the wonders of America what he considered the most remarkable thing he had seen in this country. The foreigner replied at once that it was William Borden, the wealthy, 
cultured university student kneeling in prayer at the Hope, Yale Hope Mission with his arm around one of those hopeless drunken men for whom the mission had been started. At the memorial service held in New Haven, some of the most striking tribunes were from the lips of men whom Borden had brought to Christ. Dr. William H. Sal uh, Salmon, Secretary and Treasurer of Yale Mission in China, writes in the Yale News, a deacon of his class, a member of the Senior Council, he will best be remembered as a man who devoted himself to the moral and spiritual betterment of men. He was an added supporter of Yale in China, generously supplying the funds to keep a classmate as his representative in that field. His monument in New Haven is the Yale Hope Mission, of which he was the founder and patron. Of his general influence in the university, one of his classmates writes, he seemed like a fixed beacon light in moving waters, by which the fellows could safely steer their course. He was so uncompromising with anything that he considered wrong. He was so determined to carry out every plan that he thought right. Upon his graduation in 1909, William Borden was at first inclined to enter at once upon missionary service, but was wisely advised to equip himself more thoroughly by taking a full course of theology. He accordingly entered Princeton Theological Seminary in the fall of the same year. His modesty, his clear vision of duty, his physical, mental, and spiritual vigor, and many other admirable qualities endeared him at once both to professors and students during his three years' stay in Princeton. His mother transferred her residency from Chicago to Princeton, where there was extended to his fellow st students the most generous hospitality. The students were not only influenced by what they saw of his beautiful life in the family circle, but were there privileged to meet missionaries and other Christian workers from all parts of the world. Seminary Days in Princeton In the seminary, Borden was a leader in student activities and was particularly prominent in all that concerned missionary service. During his first year, he was a delegate at the Student Volunteer Convention at Rochester and there rendered most self-denying service in connection with missionary exhibits. The same year he was appointed as a delegate to the World Missionary Conference at Edinburgh to represent the China Inland Mission, where he served as the youngest member of the Christian Council. His knowledge of missionary literature, missionary leaders, and missionary activities made him a definite force in the missionary life of the seminary. By deputation, work in schools and colleges, he also extended his influence beyond the bounds of his own institution. During these busy seminary days, his sympathies were by no means confined to work on the foreign field, for he was at the same time serving as the director of the Chicago Bible Institute and of the National Bible Institute of New York, and was an active member of the American Committee of the Nile Mission Press of Cairo. To the work of the National Bible Institute in particular, he gave much time and earnest effort. He never allowed these varied activities, however, to influence his regular duties in connection with his theological course. No student was more diligent, more faithful, more loved by those who knew him best. The summer of 1912, after his graduation from the seminary, was spent chiefly in the evangelistical work in New York City, in connection with the National Bible Institute. This involved not only administrative duties in the office, but also street preaching, the conduct of open-air services, and the distributing of tracts and testaments and other religious literature. In September, William Borden was ordained to the ministry in the Moody Church, Chicago, of which he was a member. The following three months he gave his services as a traveling secretary of the Student Volunteer movement, and visited many of the eastern colleges where he aroused new interest in the needs of the unevangelized world. On December 21, 1911, he had off offered himself for service under the China Inland Mission, and on April 8, 1912, just one year and one day before the date of his death, he received his appointment 
at a meeting of the council held in Philadelphia. He had learned that there were more than 10 million Chinese Muslims to whom no Christian missionary had ever been sent, and at his own request he was assigned to work among the Mohammedans of Kansu, the westernmost province of China. He chose this field because of its difficulty and its appalling work. Last Days in Cairo In December last, he left for Cairo, Egypt, to perform his preparation by a special study in Arabic and in Muslim literature under the direction of his friend, Dr. Samuel M. Capital Z W E M E R. During these three months, he endured himself to all the missionaries with whom he came in contact and encouraged them in all forms of service. He was instrumental in the distribution among the Muslims of 12,000 Christian tracts and greatly furthered the work of the Nile Mission Press. Of these months spent in Cairo, Dr. S. M. Capital Z W E M E R has written, quote, William Borden left a deep impression here at the study center even during his short stay. He was identified with every good movement of the missions and the YWCA and personally supervised a house-to-house -house canvas of Cairo with Christian literature and was greatly beloved by all those who learned to know him even for such a short time. We hope the message of his life will tell for the cause in America and in China as much as it has in will in Cairo. Unquote. On March 21st, he was taken ill with spinal meningitis and died on April 9th. Before news of his illness had been received, his mother and younger sister had sailed from New York to spend some time with William in the East, and they arrived in Cairo only a few hours after his death. His body was laid to rest in the American Mission Cemetery at Cairo, in a land of the very Muslims for whom redemption he had given his life. Impressive memorial services were held not only in Cairo, but in Chicago, in Princeton, in Philadelphia, in New Haven, and in New York. Footnote. Accounts of some of these services appeared in the Princeton Seminary Bulletin and in special memorial numbers of the Bible Today. A beautiful appreciation also appeared in the Sunday School Times, Philadelphia, from the pen of the Rev. Henry W. Frost, an intimate friend of the family and the American director of the China Inland Mission. End of the footnote. The daily paper in every part of the world printed more or less extended accounts of the life in which a universal interest was awakened by its high promise and tragic end. An ideal volunteer, even a superficial study of William Borden's life and character suggests the qualifications of an ideal missionary volunteer. We see in him, first of all, the peculiar endowment for missionary service the gifts of physical and mental strength, of wealth and social position, of culture and inspiring friendships. These endowments may be granted to few of us in the same degree, yet the example of his life is nonetheless stimulating. Here is one who was faithful, not in the few, but in the many things, and it surely requires a higher degree of consecration to use many talents well than to be faithful with a few. In our Lord's parable, the talent of the slothful servant was given, not to the one whose two talent two had gained other two, but to him whose five had gained five. If William Borden was faithful in the use of his many gifts, how much easier should it be for others to prove faithful with their few? There was also the clear missionary vision and it is true, this was awakened by the unusual opportunities of a world tour, but it was brightened and broadened by patient investigation and constant study and reading. Many of the young men have returned from the Far East without having taken the trouble to visit the missions, and with the resulting incriminating confession that they do not believe in foreign missions. 
Others who have had their eyes open to the world's appalling need at home have turned indifferently from the sight, or they have allowed the appealing vision to grow dim through a willful or careless neglect of the means which are found on every hand for receiving missionary intelligence and cultivating missionary zeal. Complete Dedication We see likewise a complete dedication to the missionary task. It is one thing to see the need and to possess the means for giving relief. It is quite another thing to yield all that one has and is to the service of Christ. Here was a young man who not only surrendered all, but who did so in such a spirit as to indicate, as Professor William Benton Green suggests, not only the duty of consecration, but the joy and blessedness of consecration. When he saw the need of men and the glory of his Lord, he cried out with austerity and true sincerity, Here am I, send me. William Borden is a striking example of Christian stewardship, which is another expression of sincere dedication to Christ. His money was a sacred trust, and he was as careful in his gifts as he was generous. An intimate acquaintance has told of an appeal which he made to Borden on the ground of personal friendship, that it was for an object which did not commend itself to his judgment as a Christian steward, and it was refused. How many would have made the donation merely for the sake of friendship? How few would have declined for the sake of Christ? Last Will and Testament this same sense of stewardship is embodied in his last will and testament, which stands as an example and an appeal to the whole Christian, whole Church of Christ. It is an extraordinary document not only in view of the actual bequest which it provides, but also because of the spirit it manifests of loyalty to Christ and devotion to the work of world evangelization. It is in itself a missionary appeal. Its largest provision is for the China Inland Mission, in connection with which the donor had expected to serve and how, on whose counsel he held a place. For the work of the missions he bequeathed the sum of $250,000, and with unique sympathy and thoughtfulness for one so young, this was added. I suggest that 100000 of this amount be invested and the income thereof be used for the support and maintenance of missionaries and other workers connected with said mission, who through age or infirmity have become incapacitated for active service in the mission field or at home, and who are in need of and deserving of aid. The sum of 100000 was left to the National Bible Institute of New York, and like amounts to the Moody Bible Institute of Chicago and to the Chicago Avenue Church. 50000 each was given to Princeton Theological Seminary, to the Board of Foreign Missions of the Presbyterian Church USA, to the Board of Foreign Missions of the Presbyterian Church U.S. South, to the Board of Foreign Missions of the United Presbyterian Church, and to the Chicago Hebrew Mission, and 25000 each, to the Nile Mission Press, to the American Bible Society, to the Chicago Tract Society, and to the African Inland Mission. Of the remaining estate, the China Inland Mission and the three Presbyterian boards were made the residuary legatees. The devising of money is a much simpler matter than the devotion of a life. The fact that he belonged wholly to Christ and that there were millions of Muslims in western China whom no one had volunteered to evangelize led William Borden to undertake this difficult and forbidding task. For this work he gave his life, there may be those who will ask, to what purpose this waste? There can be no doubt of the approval of that Lord who beheld the vision of the world filled with the fragrance of the perfume, which it seemingly extravagant was poured upon his feet. Whatever of wealth or of his life is dedicated to him is accepted by him and used in every widening sphere of bliss influence. Another provision of the last will and testament suggests that William Borden had a definite and adequate missionary's message. Nothing troubled him more than to see men of culture, ability, and devotion planning to undertake missionary work while they were evidently ignorant of the great essential truths of the gospel. He therefore requested that his money should be used in the support of only such men as held 
absolutely to the deity of Christ and his um, vicarious atoning death for sinners. It is further my desire, so runs the will, that the said bequest here and before must made to be used and disposed of in accordance with the following recommendations by me to wit that each of said bequests be used for and in connection with missionaries and teachers who are in sound in the faith, believing in such fundamentals as the doctrine of the divine inspiration and authority of the scriptures, the doctrine of the Trinity, including the deity of Jesus Christ, and the doctrine of atonement through the substitutionary death of our Lord Jesus Christ. I declare that each and all the gifts shall be absolute and unconditional gifts to their respective beneficiaries, except as they are conditioned by the doctrine requirements that I have made above, and that my purpose in expressing my desire as to the mode in which the same, or any of the same, shall be used, has been and is merely to indicate my considered wishes and judgment, and not to impose upon them any legal obligation to carry out my desires if, for any reason, they deemed it best not to comply with the same. Personal Convictions William Borden's own definite and clear religious convictions appear further in the standards of the National Bible Institute, for which he drafted the Articles of Belief. They appear again in the Declaration of His Personal Faith, which he submitted to the Council of China in that mission when applying for appointment, and in the article written by him for the Bible Today, entitled, What is a Christian? In the later article, he says, A Christian is first of all one who has Jesus Christ as his personal Savior. But in the New Testament we find that Christ was not looked upon as Savior alone, but also as Lord. It was the Lord Jesus Christ whose name his followers bore, and that meant that he had absolutely uh, jurisdiction over them. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 19 and 20, Romans 12, verse 1 and 2, Philippians 1, 21. A Christian is not merely one who trusts in Christ for salvation, but one who also strives earnestly to please him in all things, great and small. But Christ was even more than this to his early disciples. He himself was God manifest in the flesh. A Christian is one who worships and adores him, together with the Father and the Holy Spirit, as very God of very God. Among the beliefs which were particularly precious to him were those related to the inspiration of the Bible, justification by faith, the regenerating power of the Holy Spirit, the grace of God in Christ, the spiritual union of all true believers of every denomination, and the personal premanual return of our Lord. His acceptance of such truths was never careless, for he has, was always ready to give a reason to every man for the faith that was in him. These truths were the inspiration of his life and the explanation of his career. In spite of the definiteness and decisiveness of his beliefs, he was broad and generous in his sympathies. As Dr. Z. W. E. M. E. R. declared in the memorial service in Cairo, he gripped the essentials. He had no S H I B B O L E T H. His was no narrow creed. His Egyptian brethren could never have told to which regiment he belonged. In the army of God, he was too big to wear the distinctive colors of any regiment. Thorough preparation, the full course of study during which these convictions were maturing, and his faithful devotion to his academic and theological discipline suggest a helpful message in the matter of missionary preparations. He believed that he that this should be broad and thorough, with special adaptation to the needs of that, the, his particular field. He was not one of those who feel willing to rely upon natural resources or who postpone serious work until they reach their mission station. He worked with diligence with this in view during all the years of his university and seminary course and elected branches of study, which he believed would equip him for his chosen task. This led him to the study of Arabic in Princeton and to go to Cairo for special work with Dr. Z.W.E.M.E.R. 
Yet more willing was his example in the matter of present missionary effort. He felt that one who was to save souls in China would begin rescuing men in New Haven, and that one who was to speak in the, the bazaars and marketplaces of the Far East should not be ashamed to preach on the streets and in the parks of New York. Still more, he showed that one who was preparing for worldwide evangelization must have a broad sympathies, which led, lead to preparation in all forms of Christian service, and which obviate the lines between home and foreign, and which do not recognize any arbitrary limitation of sect. The student who engages in varying forms of Christian service at home is being prepared for the best work abroad. It was this determination to be thoroughly prepared for his difficult task that made William Borden so diligent a student at New Haven and at Princeton, and it further resulted in two unique projects. The first was his plan to secure his degree of Master of Arts from Yale University by reading in the Department of Missionary Science. The second was to pursue the study of Arabic in preparation for work among people who spoke Chinese. The latter plan led him to Cairo, and during those crowning months of his career, he showed in most marked degree the same zeal and study and enthusiasm for Christian service, which had characterized his whole course of preparation for missionary service. Recruiting for Missions One certain result of the message of his life will be an immediate increase of volunteers for missionary service and the suggestion of the particular in which he was an ideal missionary candidate. He was ever recruiting for missions. He was not only a volunteer, but he was seeking to enlist others. The leaders of the student volunteer movement for foreign missions bear eager testimony to his devotion to this great cause. Not only did he support it by generous financial contributions, but he devoted unstinted time and effort to the work. He served as a leader in the volunteer bands at the Hill School in, at New Haven and at Princeton. He attended the great conventions and helped to further their success. He finally gave the last months of his life in America to fruitful visitation of the leading Eastern colleges and university, and many of the students who witnessed to the influence exerted upon them by personal contact with him during those memorable days. One who has just returned from the Orient, and whose knowledge of the student centers there and in America, makes him best qualified to judge, remarked recently that the effect of the life and example of William Borden will result in bringing into missionary service hundreds of strongest and able volunteers. Nor is the influence of that life to be confined to those who will enter specific forms of Christian service. There is something deeply significant in the words written by one Yale classmate to another on the day that word was received of their common loss. The unbelievable has apparently happened, and I feel overwhelmed with the sense of the smallness of life. And there is one thing I know, that if ever a man was guided by God's will in his life, that man was Bill. His life and his firm purpose to be a missionary have been an inspiration to me far more than six years, and I know his influence will never depart from me. Let us continue his influence in our lives, and do something he would have approved. The Secret of the Life The secret of such a wide and abiding influence is not difficult to discern. It is found in a wholehearted and complete dedication to Christ. This devotion was manifested in the steadfastness with which he adhered to any course which he believed his master had marked out in the faithful observancy of those practices which stimulated and nourished his spiritual life. When he was convinced that anything was in accordance with the will of his master as indicated by scripture or providence, that thing was henceforth an actual part of his life. He would allow no circumstance to interfere with his daily reading of his Bible, nor with precious privilege of daily prayer with his beloved mother. When he had joined the Princeton Volunteer Band, he was certain all during the winter months to be present at the prayer meeting before breakfast at 7 o'clock every Wednesday morning, and when he had identified himself with the National Bible Institute, he was found in the summer giving up rest and recreation 
to carry on the work in the offices and to preach in the streets of New York. This dedication to Christ gave to his character, in particular transparency and gentleness and strength. He was particularly influenced by that saying of Mr. Moody, which he often quoted, The world has yet to see what God can do with a fully surrendered man. William Borden had a lamentable desire to be such a man. One of the last articles he ever wrote was a history of the origin of the student volunteer movement for foreign missions, which appeared in a recent number of the Christian Workers' Magazines. In this, he quotes a question which Mr. Robert P. Wilder used in conversation with men whom he meets in the colleges. Are you steering or drifting? Borden com comments. This served to open the whole question of a student's choice of his life work. The dangers of drifting were, of course, manifest, and if a young man said he was steering, the next question might well be, What is your goal? Who is in the boat with you? May each one of us be able to say that we are steering, and that he is not only on board, but at the helm. No one who ever spent a day with William Borden doubted that he was steering, and that his course was being directed by his master and his lord. And now that he has crossed the bar and seen his pilot face to face, his fellow Christians are privileged to rejoice as they see the abiding influences of his course and the many who are being led to follow in the way he went. They are assured that his faith is triumphant, his hope for the cause of his master made more radiant, and his love for them and for him made perfect. For now abideth faith, hope, love. These three, but the greatest of these is love. Every remembrance of his completed life, every review of his finished career, brings to each of us an added responsibility, an inspiring incentive to action, a clear commanding call to press forward with devotion and courage and zeal to the supreme task of proclaiming the gospel of Christ to all the world.